ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהים אליך העולם, אשר קידשם במצוותיו לציוון ולעסוק בדברי טוב. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to be engaged with the words of Torah. O Lord our God, we ask that you make the words of your Torah sweet in our mouth, and in the mouth of your entire people, the house of greater Israel. May we are descendants of the descendants of your people, the house of Israel. Know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, O Lord, who teaches Torah to his people of greater Israel. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all peoples, gave us to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gives us the Torah. So, we are in Parashat Tazriyah. And if you want to know what Tazriyah means, read my Friday newsletter. Because <laughs> that's where I went on into that uh, into what it means. But, uh, you know, we, we read the text of Torah and sometimes we feel, gosh, do I have to read about this graphic details of scabs and crusts and all kinds of stuff that should hardly be part of our conversation during religious meetings. It's, it's pretty crazy. And, and, and again, we read some of these things, like, like if you read the whole parasha, and this and that of next week, it's, we're left to find relevant applications. Relevant applications, and really, relevant applications as they apply to, to Yeshua, and the mission he left us. What would he have said about that? What would have been if he would have been, and, and Yeshua was, go, was going to synagogue every Saturday, was he ever called to comment on this parasha? What would he have said? You know, what would he have said? Pretty interesting. So, and uh, when we read the instructions in Leviticus, we, we, we are taught about distinction and about what, what is deemed acceptable or what is considered unclean and untouchable. That's what we read about. We read about quarantines, we read about... And the instructions that we read ex ex tell us to exclude from our midst lepers, women with a, who, who are bleeding, those who are blind or have physical defects. It seems very archaic. Uh, it seems heartless. But of course, we cannot today. We cannot today judge a society that is so far removed from our today's reality with our standards, with the standards of our day. If they looked at us and the things we allow, we think are okay. They think we are archaic, you know. So, I mean, we can't even judge uh, an urban American society of 50, 60 years ago without finding its way of life archaic. And people, people who are 80 year old today, 70, 80 year old today, get in serious trouble for things they did when they were 20 that were maybe acceptable in those days. And so it's very, uh, very tough. So, but here's, there's something else we need to realize, okay? And I'm going to restart my slide things. Where am I? Okay. Yeah. What do I have here? Yeah, that's good. So uh, there's something else that we need to realize. There is on the one side the instructions concerning ritual contamination and handicapped, but there's also the wrong attitudes that man has developed through them. There is the word of God on how to treat these things, and there is how society sometimes misapplies the word of God. But the instructions of the Torah 
are pure, like David says. But the sinful wickedness, it is the sinful wickedness of our hearts that creates wrong application. So when we read the Torah, we got to say, well, somehow it's pure, it's great, it's good, it's holy, it's right. If we read it and we don't understand it, the problem is not with the Torah, the problem is here. So it, it's the sinful wickedness of our heart that creates uh, cruel applications of the commandment sometimes. Huh? History is witness to what I'm saying. Uh, through bigotry, racism, uh, and many other things that have been done in the world through um, cruel, evil, wrong application of, of the word God. And then people blame the word God. Uh, uh, separation for ritual purposes, like the whole question of the leper, it was a ritual separation. Just like you, uh, if somebody has a cut, you know, there's blood and stuff. You know. So separation for ritual purposes had nothing to do with sin or the character of people. It was purely ceremonial. If today you enter a computer chip plant, you will be asked to don special clothing and enter a dust-free room and not, and not touch certain things. They're not saying that you're dirty or a bad person, that you're going to break something or contaminate. They're, it has nothing to do with, with your conscience or morals. It was purely functional. Purely functional. Same happens if you go to, I go sometime to interpret in surgery room. I'd have to put the whole bunny suit and everything. But, you know, wash my hands. And... So, so it is with these instructions. The problem, uh, the problem is with ceremonial purity that we lack because we are human people entering an area that is set apart for ceremonial purity i.e. the temple or whatever else. In fact, we are dusty. From the time of our birth, death takes a hold of us, which makes us unfit to appear before Hashem. Everything about Hashem is about life. But as human beings, we are contaminated with death from the minute we are born. So, yes, the human problem of ceremonial contamination comes from the original sin, and in that way we are all guilty as charged. We are all unclean. Not just the leper, not just the woman with the issue of blood. But sad to say, with time, these holy instructions became infected with the self-righteous, elitist pride of man. We, we always use difference, not in order to see it like flat, but to see up and down, with who's on top, who's at the bottom. We cannot see difference just same level. It's our pride. We always want the other, the above. You know, and this is a this is our nature. You know, um, but thank God for Yeshua, who came to address the wrong attitudes of his day. Instead of throwing stones at lepers, like was sometimes customary, he touches them, like we read. Instead of yelling, unclean, at the woman with the issue of blood, he 
heals her. Instead of look, looking at the man blind from earth with a superior look of disgust, ah, must be from sin. He gives him sight. He also heals the lame man, thus reinstalling him to society. Biblical leprosy was a physical condition as well as ceremonial condition. And it also was a spiritual condition that in the biblical Jewish biblical command commentaries talk about it as akin to evil speech, gossip, and slander. But I'm not going to talk about this today. I'll wait for it when we come to that parsha in the book of Numbers. Today, in the modern world, we don't have physical leprosy. Uh, at least not in industrials, in industrialized countries. But still have it in India. I remember the lepers in the streets in India. You know, when, when uh, we were there, I don't know, maybe there is less now. We were, it's a long time ago when we were there. But, but uh, uh, modern world, we don't have it. But we have another kind of leprosy in the, in the, the modern world. Uh, we have the spiritual kind that is akin to, that is akin to evil speech, gossip, and slander. We actually have a pandemic of it. We have a pandemic of the spiritual condition of leprosy, a pandemic of slander, gossip, evil speech, all perpetrated by media, be it social or otherwise. We, we do a lot of that. It's really hard when we have an opinion about something or somebody to not want to voice it. But slander is akin to murder in the Bible. So, also the, the term leper, which is actually uh, metzora, that's the word leper, which is the name of the parasha next week. It, it, it's used in different ways in our language. We we use it to describe a person, a persona non grata, someone rejected by the majority and left out in the cold. To be treated like a leper is an experience most of us have had one time or another. And it's one that I would say Yeshua understood. Come to think of it, he himself was rejected and despised. He was rejected and despised. He was treated like a leper. And uh, yeah, maybe this is why the Talmud describes him as the leper messiah. The Talmud describes the Messiah, talks about the Messiah as the leper Messiah. In a story about how the Messiah would be found caring for lepers. In the section of the Talmud called Sanhedrin 98a and 98b, we read, his name is the leper scholar. Somebody prophesying about who is Messiah, he calls him the leper scholar. Scholar means somebody who studies Torah and is knowledgeable of the Torah. As it is written, and then they use Isaiah 53, it says, Surely he has borne our grief, carried our sorrow, yet we did, his, we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. That's Talmudic quote, pre-Yeshua. When will the Messiah come, they say. Go ask him himself, was his reply. Where is he sitting at the entrance? It's a Talmudic Midrashic conversation, you know. So, where is he sitting? At the entrance. 
And by what sign may I recognize him? He is sitting among the four lepers. It's a meat writer says the Messiah will be found bandaging the lepers by the gates of the city of Rome. That's a pretty Yeshua thing. Uh, so this passage shows us that even in Judaism, the Messiah was seen as someone carefully bandaging the wounds of lepers, not shunning them or stoning them. So you see, there's always what really the Torah te tries to teach us, that there is our evil applications of it. So, so those are, the Torah teaches us about the problem of uncleanliness of leprosy. This section of the Talmud, which is a commentary, the Talmud, which is a commentary to help us with the application of Torah, teaches us about compassion for physical lepers, not rejection. Leviticus tells us that those with a contagious disease translated as leprosy, must be put outside the camp, considered unclean. It is in fact teaching us about quarantine for health reasons. But such a person should be treated with compassion. If you remember when Miriam, who became leprous because of her criticizing of Moshe, and we will read about that in the book of Numbers. Oh. Moshe pleaded for her and even personally went in to care, care for her at his own risk. Now, we have in the Torah the prayer Moshe prayed for his sister who had criticized him. She, her, Miriam, the prophetess, the leader, was teaching everybody wrong by criticizing the God's leader. That was terrible. If you're a little person somewhere and you say something, but well, when you're one of the leaders, your words are power, but cloud. So both her and her brother, they were both criticizing Moses. And as far as the case of Miriam, she became leprous. And Moshe didn't go and say, well, good for you. You have it coming, big sis. You know, but no, he, he prayed a heart cry for her. He prayed a heart cry for her. And in all the texts I've read that he even went himself to care for her. That's not written, but it's in Jewish books. You know, so that... It is written, he, he, he personally had a beautiful prayer for her. He pleaded, Moshe. So, and in doing so, Moshe, who is called the first redeemer, foreshadowed the ministry of Yeshua, the second redeemer, who is like unto Moshe, by caring for the lepers, and also, as Moshe the legislator, Moshe the priest, Moshe the prophet forgave his sister's sin of criticizing him by person and personally mediated with Hashem for her care. He was a perfect example of love your enemy, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. He was a perfect example of that. There are some parts of the Talmud that where Judaism endorses the rejections, the mean rejection, the cruel rejection of lepers, but legitimizing the practice of throwing rocks at them. The Talmud is, is a commentary. Uh, we also learn in some places that women are unclean during their monthly, that anyone with an issue of blood is to be separated. We right away think about the poor woman who 
was cloistered out of fellowship for years because she had an issue with blood. Then later, we read that those with blindness, the lame, and those with other defects are banned for certain er from certain areas of the temple. That's what we read. The idea was that if you touch them, or they touch you, you become unclean. And in the Torah, to be unclean really is not a big deal. To be ceremonially unclean is really not a big deal. All you have to do before you go to the temple is immerse. Or wait till the next day. You're clean the next day. You know, so that's it's really not a big deal. But human application made it such harsh and complicated deal. Making Torah compliance on every a very heavy burden on people, which is something Yeshua criticized the religious leaders of his day for. It's a sin to make Torah application so complicated that it discourages people to, from following. This is why I always give you the lowest way to apply, so that you can do more you can, but at least do the minimum. So, since man application of the Torah against the unclean was very harsh, he wanted to avoid any contact with uncleanliness. And then, that's what leads us to stories like the parable that Yeshua gave, how the priest and the Levite did not want to have the poor man dying on the side of the road, because they were more concerned with their ritual purity than with their responsibility of compassion towards their brother. And then Yeshua told that story, putting to shame the religious leader of these days, showing that even a Samaritan has more sense than they do. Messiah comes, and when Messiah comes, he changes everything. Thank God. Because we read in the text left us by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read how Yeshua teaches a reversal of these attitudes. Yeshua, the Messiah, overcomes all the, he doesn't neglect, he doesn't delete them, he doesn't uh, uh, stop them, he overcomes all these defilements and restrictions. He cures lepers. He heals a man born blind. He delivers the woman with the issue of blood. And, and an unnamed outcast was suddenly given new life and a new start. In Yeshua, the Messiah, we see an overcoming, an overpowering of the statuses of clean and unclean. Instead of becoming sullied by outcast, his mighty power over sin and death brings cleanliness. It brings the opposite. Instead of him being dirty by the outcast, he cleans those whom he touches. He touched the leper. That's, it's in Luke, that story. Luke was a doctor. That's why he, he really appreciated that story and he gave that detail. So, he, his mighty power over sin and death brings cleanliness, life and health to all he touched. Life and giving new life to all he, life and health to all he touched. And we read in the book of Acts how his disciples continued in that same attitude. We read how Peter was really given the gift of healing. He would go and people would try to, you read in the book of Acts, people would try to not just touch him, but to be, to have his shadow come on them. You know, it's like he would go to the temple and say, oh, here. And the disciples, not just Peter, but the disciples did that stuff. They were given that power from Yeshua. So we see that the disciples also, instead of shunning the unclean, 
the leper, the sick, and the handicapped, they approach them to heal and cleanse them. So should we. But we may not feel like we have the gifts of healing, you know, that everybody's going to come to try to be touched by the shadow, you know, and they're going to be healed. But we may not feel that we have that. Some of us may have, I don't know. But what we can claim is the gift of compassion. We can have compassion. There is a, one of the gifts in the list, in the list of gifts, spiritual gifts, one of them is called the gift of helps. I think it's the most useful of all. Most useful than speaking or interpreting tongues or miracles, but the gift of helps. And why it's the most useful of all? Because anybody can have it. Anybody can have it. You know, it's a when we get up and help somebody, help the situation, it's a spiritual manifestation of the Spirit of God in us overcoming our own pride and selfishness. You know, we help. It's a spiritual gift. It's in the Corinthians. So we may not feel like we, we have the gift of healing, but we can have the gift of compassion. We may not feel like we can restore paralytic to help, but we can comfort them, make them feel a part. And we can pray a sincere prayer for them. I mean, I'm sure you've had the experience that <clears throat> somebody was feeling bad and we prayed a prayer for them and they felt at least better. They felt acknowledged. They felt seen by the Lord because somebody took the time to, to, to pray a sincere prayer for them. It can bring food. It can bring more than money. I think time is the most valuable commodity to give our time either in prayer or to do something. Some people would rather give money than their time. <laughs> you know, so... Biblical leprosy and sickness can be understood as the result of sin, the result of the fall of humanity. But Paul reminds us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He reminds us that. All of us. And he reminds us too that the result of sin is death. So we all, as we are all subject to physical death, we're also subject to spiritual death, thus all subject to contaminate, ceremonial contamination. So in a way, any one of us, every one of us can and should say, should say, I am the leper. When we look at in that story, we should say, I'm the leper that Yeshua healed. I'm the woman with an issue of blood that was quarantined and cloistered. I'm the one who was blind from birth. And we can all understand being blind even in our understanding, blind to God's commandment, blind to the Torah. I'm the woman whose back was bent and Yeshua straightened. You know, it's like there was this woman, and, and as, uh, Christina had me take a picture of her on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. She was just like this, uh, walking like this. She reminded me of that, yeah, she reminded me of that woman that Yeshua healed. And when Yeshua healed her, people said, Why do you do that on Shabbat? I said, Oh, really? You're asking me that, huh? It's like he's the one who circumvented all the circumstances and just did it. Uh, we can say, I am the paralytic man who can't move, can't do anything because my body is so wrong. 
If we can't say that about ourselves, we may have a distorted view of ourselves. You know, it is just that some of us have that sara'at, that leprosy manifested in our body, while with others of us it's more internal. But really, there's no difference. Not only lepers needed to immerse when they went to the temple, but every Israeli, every person, not just lepers. Uh, Yeshua knows, Yeshua shows us when we read this text of the Greek, he shows us that he had the power and authority to deal with all of our ailments, all the ailments that paralyze us and hold us back spiritually and physically. You know, I, I don't know if I said it to you in time, but I always think about that story. The, it's a true story about the woman who willed a miracle. She's, she was a woman who had a son who was, I think, our, a doctor's son who was a uh, muscular dystrophy. They gave it to her to take care of this baby uh -huh. because they knew that the baby was going to die. He was blind. He was deaf. And, and he, he couldn't had, move. He, could, he was like a vegetable. Yeah. So and she said, I'll take care of him. <laughs> Gosh. But she was not a young lady either. You know. So, and what she did, she took care of it. And she played music. She, she, she took care of him like a, any other child. And at one point, she she tried an experiment because she felt his body, the muscles were not holding him. The, it's we have the bones, but the, the muscles is what holds everything together, really. And so what she she strapped him on. A, he was a teenager, okay. <laughs> she was not like a big lady. She strapped him on her back, the legs, the arms, I guess the necks, the head doesn't fall, you know, and she strapped him on her back so that whatever she did, he moved with her. You know, she moved around, he moved his arm. She walked, he walked. And eventually, his muscles started to be strong enough through the exercise, and he was able to walk and stand by himself. You know, it's like, I think it's beautiful. I think it's such an example of we are that young man. We strap ourselves on Yeshua and we live. You, know, you can find the story yourself on, on YouTube. It's called The Woman Who Wills a Miracle. It's a beautiful story, a true story. And that man became a pianist. Yes, that's right. He became a pianist. He became a pianist. Yeah. So. That's what Yeshua does for us. He straps us on himself so that we're given life and strength and can play beautiful music with our lives. Um, now, when we talk about Messiah in the old Midrashic texts, there are, there are, some, there are three really main specific miracles that people expected from Messiah. One, he would be able to heal leprosy. Second, he would cast out a mute demon, which we know he did. Third, he would be able to heal the lame. And in part, the set of qualification is heard in the words of Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, which is the Messianic prophecy, where it says, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf, deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame man will leap like a deer, and the mute person's stone will sing, for in the desert springs will burst forth streams of waters in the Arabah. 
It's amazing to think that no Israelite leper had never presented himself to the priest saying, I'm clean, can you check me and we'll do the offering? That, that In our text today, we read that if somebody is clean, he needs to go to the priest for the priest to confirm that they are clean and then do the required offering. In the whole history of Judaism, it hadn't happened. Yeah, there were small brushes with Moshe's sister, Naaman the Syrian, but there's never been the case of a Jew under the Mosaic Torah who had to follow that procedure as laid out in Leviticus 14. Where it says, this shall be the Torah of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, etc. On the day Yeshua sent the first cured leper to the temple to be checked over by the priest, it would have been the first time it ever happened. It had never happened in history before. What a momentous event. It feels like Leviticus 13 and 14 were written just for that moment to happen, to show us a miracle, to show us a miracle, and that the Messiah truly come. Similarly, when Yeshua had healed the demoniacally oppressed man who was mute, it must have caused quite the stir of messianic hope among the people. It makes sense then when John the Baptist sent people to check to see if the Messiah really was the Messiah, Yeshua answered, go and tell Yohanan what you are hearing and seeing. The blind see you again, the, light, the lame are walking, people with Sahaat are being cleansed, the deaf are hearing, the dead are being raised, the good news being told to the poor, and how blessed is anyone who is not offended in me. He knew those were the, the prophets. Now I want to end this with something about the role of the priest in this. In the book of Leviticus, we read that the priest was the one who had the authority to declare someone clean or unclean. That priest's word was final. A doctor couldn't come and say, I think you blew it, priest. In, in that case, the priest had more authority than the doctor. You know? So, and, and because, and also the priest is a mediator between God and man. Because of enmity, Paul talks about the enmity between God and man because of sin, uh, about how time we contact. The priest were the the mediator, the, the, the mediator between us and Hashem, with the offerings and everything. The priests were seen as peacemakers. Well, the, guy, the other guys who make the connection. Okay, uh, they, uh, you, uh, you search on your phone, Levite something, got a connection to the Almighty. So, and I often tell you about the story of Aaron who used to go as a peacemaker between people. He did that because he really understood his role as priest, the peacemaker between God and man, and he could apply it to the peacemaker between man and man. He used the same technique. That was the role of a priest, the mediator who makes peace. You know, today we talk about two countries in having war. Well, there is another country who comes as a mediator, actually. Israel, it's not much in the news, but Israel is very much used to mediate between Russia and Ukraine. You know, so uh, this is this was the role of the priest. So, and this is why actually Psalm 133 was written about Aaron. You know, uh, how good a pleasant for brothers to live together in harmony, it's like the fragrant oil on the head of, that runs down the beard of Aaron. The priest had the authority to destroy somebody's life by, by declaring 
unclean. And to restore it, to restore somebody to society by declaring clean. This is a lot of power. Today in Israel, you have rabbis who have the authority to give the label of kosher to a store that sells food, to a butcher, or to whatever. And if he doesn't, you will not get a lot of clients in Israel. And sometimes they use it for politics. If they don't like you, they won't give you. It happened to my cousin in Israel because the rabbi who was supposed to certify him didn't like him, he didn't give it to him. You know, it's a, that's sad. We shouldn't use our power and authority for things like that. But sad to say we're human, we often push our thumb on the scale of judgment for people we don't like or lie to them if we have an interest in it or if we like them. And either one of these ways are wrong. We should judge righteous judgment. But sad to say in our world today, we may be more concerned about being self-righteously self publicizing other people's issues, even put our thumb on the scale of negative judgment, while omitting the good side of their personality and of their deeds. And that's very sad. It's very sad. We, as disciples, need to make sure our judgment is 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 level is a uh, not level is a uh, da 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 with truth and mercy is <laughs> was that balance. Thank you. Hashem blessed the Jewish people by telling them in Exodus. 19 and you shall be a nation set apart you shall be a kingdom of priests a kingdom of Kohanim, a nation set apart at passover yeshua gave his disciples a form of priestly initiation he washed their hands and the feet of the disciples a priest can declare someone clean someone unclean someone good someone bad as such, we also have the power to destroy people by loose lips, perverted judgment through the things we say about people. It's more important when we say, I'm a disciple, I believe in God, then people give more clout to what you say. So, well, you must be moved by the Spirit. This is a person who's got the most here is a, there is a particular rabbi called Shallow. He said, a person who finds fault with others is really projecting his own faults and imperfection on others. Ooh. That's what this rabbi is saying. He and uh, another rabbi from, the, from a book called Kedushim says, those who try to invalidate others do so with their own blemishes. Basically what they're saying is that the bad you find in others is probably something that originates yourself, from yourself. There is a way of, there is a proverb in English that's saying, which is to say that uh, you usually accuse others of the things you usually accuse others are very often due to a very thorough knowledge of ourselves. You know, if we can't believe somebody, uh, somebody did, somebody did not react a certain way to something because we know how we would react and we can't, can't believe something. So it's pretty. Ooh, don't want to get too psychological here, but there is a rabbi and psychologist. Zeli Pliskin, who adds to this, and he says, one means of finding out, of finding out your own faults and blemishes, we all need this, especially at the time of Passover, we have to find it, right? One, one means of finding out your own faults and blemishes is to see what faults and blemishes you notice in others. It's to see what faults and blemishes you notice in others. If you focus on certain negative aspects of others, it is possible 
that you have the same tendencies yourself. It makes sense. We know about them because they're familiar to us. So I'll stop here with the psychology. <laughs> Uh, the Talmud also proclaims that a judge who, you know, when somebody is supposed to judge a case, they're supposed to say if they're fit, if they feel they're fit or unfit. If they have a, if they have interest in the judgment being either guilty or not guilty, they say, no, I'm not fit to do this case. If, uh, if they feel sorry for the person, they will pervert justice. They say even justice should not even be perverted by the tears of an old woman. You know, justice is justice. You know, so, so they're supposed to withdraw themselves. And he says, uh, the Talmud says, a judge who cannot find within himself the sin of the person he judges is unfit to judge. If we cannot find it within ourselves, we're not fit. And the reason for that is we will lack the compassion and mercy that is required in order, in order to balance true judgment. Like King Solomon says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. The truth of the matter will mercy. But to have that mercy and compassion, we must be able to find that fault in ourselves. If not, all we have is self-righteous condemnation. Finally, Peter exhorted the Roman congregation of Jewish and Gentile disciples, saying, uh, Did I write it? You will be a kingdom of priests? Or something like that? Uh, it's not the one I wanted to write. <laughs> he says, You are a royal priesthood. <laughs> That's what he tells. So, this is what we are we are a royal priesthood. We need to take our role very seriously. And as a final prayer, I would say, I would say, may we be priests like Yeshua. Priests who can identify the unclean with care, love, mercy, and compassion. Priests who judge righteous judgment Priests who are quicker to find the good than to find the bad. Priests who may be like Aaron, the priest who learn to look dimly at the fault of others. May we be priests who produce peace and reconciliation between Hashem and man as well as between man and man. Shem Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Amen.